630 Chad presents The Announcers. Opinion, personality, passion. The Announcers on 630 Chad, Edmonton's breaking news and conversation station. Thanks for tuning into this week's edition of The Announcers here on 630 Chad. Joining me, uh, regular on the program, Andrew Gross, co-host of the 630 Chat Afternoon News. I, I didn't think I had an option, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm a regular show. No, sure. you don't. Okay, well, fair enough. But Jalen and I, your co-host in the yep. afternoons, uh, busy on other matters, which means we get to welcome producer Kelsey Wing Garrick to the show. You produce the announcers as well, so today I suppose double duty. Yeah, thanks for having me on board. It's a uh, been a crazy couple of weeks with this wildfire outside Fort McMurray. Then it hits the town, a mass evacuation, the biggest in Alberta's history. And our coverage has evolved along with the story. Where's your head at? You know, that's an interesting question. I, I've talked to people over the last week, and the first thing out of their mouths is about our coverage. And I almost feel guilty in any way saying thank you or, you know, or describing um, how difficult it is because I've redefined what difficult is. Difficult is being evacuated from your home. Difficult is not knowing if your house is burned down. Doing long days disseminating information is not difficult. It's just, uh, I don't know the right word for it. It's consuming. It's, I don't have a whole lot of fuel left. We follow these sort of templates when we put shows together and you identify issues that matter to people. You identify what people are talking about, what information is out there that people may be interested in. And then we care yes. about what our audience thinks about that. And we leave time for dialogue. Kelsey, in producing shows over the last couple of weeks, we've had to break the mold of how we put shows together and, and follow sort of an entirely different format. Yeah, kind of to piggyback on what you're saying, Andrew, it, it is all consuming when we have disasters like this. And as much as it's an incredibly trying time, um, it's during these times that I fall in love with this medium even more. Um, I, I love the immediacy of it. And I, I loved the pace at which we were able to get immediate information out, breaking information. The second we were hearing it, and most often we were, we're, we're still taking press conferences live from the premier. We're having, you know, Darby Allen doing updates from Highway 63 and Highway 881. We're the, with that technology and our ability to stream and get that out. It's it. It's just incredible. Of course, there are Albertans that are eager to move on from talking fire 24-7, as is the case oftentimes when people are witness to what we would describe as comprehensive or extensive or wall-to-wall -wall coverage. The fact of the matter is you approach this from a content side, from an editorial side, differently every day because we know for some people their daily reality has moved on from the Fort McMurray fire if they have the luxury of geographic geographically being hours yeah. and hours away. For other people, the reality of this fire will be the same as it's been for those in southern Alberta still rebuilding after the floods of 2013, those in Slave Lake who are in some cases just a year back into their new home after those fires in 2011. And there have been natural disasters across Canada and, of course, around the world where for the people immediately and directly involved, it's a challenge and it changes their reality for years. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm always learning about this, uh, this media business. I'm learning all the time. And let's be honest, I wasn't hired because... Um, you know, I'm great at breaking stories or covering them. I was hired to add color to the to the shows that I'm on, some slice of life, some comedy. So covering a breaking story is not my thing. I mean, that's not the reason I'm here, but you feel, of course, this obligation to do the best possible job. And the one thing you can bring to the show is the a familiar voice, which I think is helpful to listeners to hear from somebody they whose voice they recognize. But I've noticed over this past 10 days, two weeks, that there's a cycle to this that's very similar to the fire itself. There's the the discovery that something's happening and to move quickly to do something about it. The firefighters did it. Media did it. Then there's the battling of the actual fire, which is, you know, bringing all the information to everybody, uh, figuring out the best way to do it, what's the most important information. And now I'm starting to see us move into that cycle of mop-up, which you start putting out spot fires. And some of those spot fires um, are incorrect stories, uh, misinformation, just 
and it's discouraging. And I, I, I can imagine that it's, and I'm just being really honest here. It's, I, it's discouraging, I'm sure, when you, ha- you gain three steps and go back one as a firefighter. It's, I find it discouraging as a media person that you've done everything possible to get the most accurate information out, and then somebody's meme or tweet suddenly catches fire. And, and there's your you know, spot fire of misinformation, and people start asking us if it's true, and you see people that you know and respect retweeting it or favoring it, and, and you just know it's not true. Or at least I don't believe a lot of these to be true. And I find that really frustrating. I will agree with you, but I will also say at this time when the pace is slow, slowed down, people are out of their homes, they're safe in places, they're finding family to stay with, they've you know traveled across the country. Um, this is also the time where we get to dig into more of the beautiful stories. This mm, week, true. you know, Ryan, you got to talk to a couple who got married, they were supposed to get married last <laughs> weekend. Um, instead, Ched, as a medium, was able to reach out to the listeners. They came together, we had a wedding planner, we had jewelers come through, donate wedding rings. And we get to kind of share the really beautiful things that people are doing to step up for complete strangers, um, but mutual Canadians. Um, And then we also get to talk about, like, uh, we're getting to talk to the Canadian Angel Network. These are people helping um, Fort McMurray evacuees travel across the country who have only that prepaid debit card in their hand. And that has to last them until they get to their real home in New Brunswick or somewhere in Nova Scotia. That's, sure. This is the cool part. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And I mean, you look at the different fundraising efforts, and you just your your mind is blown. Our own, our own included. You know, the backyard. Um, that donor fort, drive was was this, just crazy. absolutely Nine incredible. Nine semi trailers. Exactly. Full. But even that, and, and again, you know, now I guess maybe I'm being what I don't like about situations like this. But you have something like that where you say, "Look how much food was donated." And somebody reaches out by text and says, well, how much did you raise for the homeless before there was a fire in Fort McMurray? And Which is a great point. <laughs> yeah, but it's, is it the right time to make the point? I mean. Yeah, yeah and, and, it's, and it's funny because, you know, I think, I think that we wear our hearts on our sleeves as broadcasters, at least on this station we do. And it's what I love about it. Uh, we let people know sometimes when the text message uh, read out that screen in front of us can sometimes demoralize yes. a broadcaster, at least take a little bit of wind out of the sails. And it's interesting, the power of work that people have and 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 folks know that that's why they employ yep. their words that's why they pass those messages along but you saw a few of those you know i mean i remember one that jumped out at me this week and yeah i didn't read it on the air i'll say it now but but someone said what's so special about these fort mcmurray evacuees you know the the alberta economy was the one that tore through our family's reality we lost our home we were in a sense evacuated and on one hand you go how can you put it so crassly what's so special about these Fort McMurray evacuees. But at the same time, that person's reality is that they too That's are true. homeless. It's different circumstance. And you understand right now, these are these are tough and unique and interesting times in the province of Alberta. How, how drastically different the conversations are that we're having today through these weeks than three years ago, let's say. Drastically different. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, sharing text, we got a text this week that was simply um, the media is exaggerating um, this disaster. Yeah, milking it, someone said to me. Really? I I would love to be able to move off this topic, but the only way we can move off this topic is everybody's home and at work again in Fort McMurray. That's how we're going to be able to fully move off this topic. I would love to. It's... It's draining, and, and and you know, I mean, is that wrong for me to say? It's, no, because I realize other people. Real. Yeah, other people have gone through so much more. Um, it, it's draining, and and to see the devastation, and to continue to report about it, and everything we do here, I put in terms of um, my own life, and and I think about what would happen if that was us, and and you know, and I feel for those people, and I. I, I just feel like I want to start delivering good news to them. I mean, that was the the hardest thing in the first two three days was searching for the. Is there a silver lining some here, or somewhere here that we can just put out there? I, you know, and, and you asked earlier. You you know, we talked about it before about well, when can you start lightening things up and have a few laughs? And part of me thinks they'd probably enjoy that. It it would be nice to sure. 
you know, but yeah, how nothing do you do else that? a distraction. Exactly. But you've got to be you, you've got to be sensitive and you've got to be strategic. And I think it's it's the same way. I mean, how do we conduct ourselves personally when 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 a friend or a family member unexpectedly passes away? You know, yeah. at, at what point is it okay to to tell an irreverent story about them? <laughs> Maybe one of your favorite memories. At what point is it okay to to, to wisecrack to their bereaved spouse or sibling or parent? Yeah. At what point is it okay to to lighten the mood in a room a little bit? And it's different for different people. Sure. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, even I think in the first week when we were first kind of really into the coverage, I, I booked a, an ecologist on the show to talk about how tree wreath growth happens after fires occur. And we had that conversation, is it too soon when you're talking about, let's throw out some silver linings. We're talking about people who've lost everything, but hey, good news, fire's great for forests. Yeah, yeah. Like, That's yeah. not you really what they want to hear. You don't care if your hear. house burned down. You don't care about the health of the forest maybe at that point. But but like, you, like you're alluding to, Kelsey, there are, there are small, uh, let me well. Uh, let me explain what I'm going to say. When I when I call so, the loss of someone's house, the loss of someone's business, a small scale story to that person, uh, that of is course. a monstrous, yeah. monumental story. I'm not indicating it's not big or significant to them, but t- with regards to the province, if someone loses their home in a fire, we can all go, oh gosh, it's a punch to the gut. Uh, but the bigger stories sometimes are how does a community rebuild? You know, for example, when when will oil sands operate? be back online? What what does yeah. Canada's energy security and supply look like? What is the impact of this fire on the Fort McMurray, the Alberta, and the Canadian economy? I mean, these are bigger scale stories that need to be addressed as well. And when we're talking about oil workers, I've been staying in close touch with a friend who lost his house in Fort McMurray, is staying with extended family in Calgary. And I've just been touching base every day. Do you need a place to stay in Edmonton? Um, and he's like, we're already talking about getting, they're trying to find ways to fly us from all the different locations that we're all staying now up to a camp up north to work. And I just can't imagine where your head is at where where he doesn't have anything with him. He doesn't have work boots or proper attire. Mm. And he's staying with extended family that he doesn't really have a relationship with outside of the fact that they share the last name. Um, and now he's going to be flown in. He's going to see the disaster that was his hometown. And... Uh, and where, be like, expected to focus on work. Focus on work, and yeah. then where do you go back? Are you asking the favor? Like, can I keep flying back into Calgary? Is it, like, how long term can I stay with you? Th- those awkward hmm. conversations are like I'm watching the Fort McMurray evacuation help group on Facebook every day, all day, and so many people are saying I'm so tired of feeling like this burden to these people who thought they were taking me in for a night or two or even a week. Now we're going on week two, week three, and I can tell that we are just a complete burden. We can't afford to rent an apartment in Edmonton right now. What do we do? Hmm. That's interesting because, you know, that sort of reminds me, and I, I feel a lot of guilt. Uh, I, it's it's sort of tapered off now in the last few days. But when this all started, um, I would do whatever I had to do here. Then I would go home and I would research and print and contact people. And it seemed like all I did was the fire. And then I'd go to sleep and wake up in the morning and I'd see what had changed and I'd reprint what, you know, and then two, three days into it, my wife asked me if I wanted to go with her to HomeSense to pick out pictures for the the bathroom that she just painted. And I just, I don't know, I, I, I felt guilty. I thought, I would love for that to be my priority right now. I would love to not, I, I'd love to be able to drop everything and just say, yeah, yeah, we need a picture in the bathroom. But part of me, I, I couldn't go. I couldn't go. How do you go pick out a picture for the bathroom when everything else is happening? I don't know. It's just been a very confusing time for me. It's it, this past. You know what I think the best thing to do is to do exactly what we're doing right now, which is just to talk. Yeah. Because you do feel, and I know that people are having these conversations over beers or around dinner tables or hopefully not around campfires right now. (laughs) But, uh, you know, you you, you do. You you start to feel like, uh, to to be dramatic about it, uh, that you're abandoning the collective. Exactly. Almost as though you're you're flippantly moving on before, you know, sort of too soon. Right. You know? And I get angry um, when I see, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, when you see uh, false information out there, um, and, and and when it comes in during the show, part of me can't contain myself. Like, What's one that's jumped out at you? What's one that's driving the Mars you nuts? bomber? The Martian Mars bomber. That, yeah, that that really irritates me. That that story continues to cycle around and around again. That for whatever reason, there were, through some conspiracy or lack of funds or whatever else, that we didn't get this fantastic 
aircraft that with one pass could put out this entire fire. It's absolutely just not true. And I, 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 again, I know that from previous experience having worked for the Alberta Forest Service. I know that Mars bomber is 70 years old. It was available back when I was fighting forest fires. It was rarely... So it's old. It's, it's old. It's but really old. It is really old, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, it's not used for good reason. I mean, it's first of all, it's dry docked right now anyway for uh, various reasons. I don't know if that's done yet. It only lands on water. That's number one. It only lands on water, which means it has to be refueled on water. So you need a big enough lake to land this massive plane. Picture a B-52, something that magnitude. So you have to have a lake that you can land on. You also have to have a lake that can carry the payload that it picks up. That's also got to be a sizable lake with no ice on it. There, and keeping in mind the nearest lake north of Fort McMurray still had sections of ice on it when this whole fire started. The, because it's so massive and because the payload's so big, it climbs very, very slowly. Its maneuverability when loaded isn't good. I, I want you now to picture 40 helicopters in the air, small planes buzzing around the fire site, everybody's got to get out of the way. Everybody's got to clear that airspace for this plane to make a single pass. Now, after it's made its single pass, it's now got to rush back to that lake and be refueled because it's going to use up its fuel. That's how far the lake is. That's how big the payload, uh, how much of a drain the payload is on. It is one of the least efficient ways to fight a fire. But if you've never heard of it before or you just see a meme about it or you read a single or sentence. Or blowhard Ezra Levant politicizes a natural disaster to help raise money for his website so he can make right. a Fort McMurray donation for his tax deduction. Exactly. And yes, I on purpose am directly calling out Ezra Levant and shaming him for politicizing this, but he has an army of believers yes, that will take whatever he says and he implies that Rachel Notley doesn't care about her home province and that's why she's not employed the Martian Mars bomber, ignoring the fact that the province of British Columbia two summers ago, and I, as my understanding goes, last summer they took a look again, the province of British Columbia elected to say no to the Martian Mars bomber because it didn't fit the bill anymore. But Andrew, right. people don't concern themselves with, with the facts. facts. Exactly. And I want you to consider just for a second, and then I'll, I'll invent it fully on this, and I'm actually feeling really good about having the opportunity because I have it so far. I want you to picture that with fires crowning across trees, with embers crossing entire rivers and highways, and, and, and now portions of Fort McMurray on fire. Uh, I want you to picture your own house, your own neighborhood, your corner store on fire. Would you like to wait the half hour for the Mars bomber to make its run, or would you rather wait the 15 minutes to 5 to 15 minutes for a helicopter to come spot that fire for you? They're doing it in the most effective and efficient way possible. And I can tell you that when I see those numbers and know the area that they're covering, they're doing a remarkable job because the number one cause of injury or death during a, a firefighting session is typically an air collision. When too many aircraft are in the same spot, same space, or as we saw with the evacuation, which was masterfully done, but the only fatality a car accident. Keep in mind as well that with this Martian Mars bomber, and we could move on or we don't have to, to different topics, uh, different myths, different opinions people have had. Uh, you're not only having to clear the airspace, Andrew, but because of the load of water that it's dropping, uh, you also have to clear out the firefighters on the ground. Correct. That's and right. that is a very significant measure to take. And you're not asking them to move 30 feet this way or 30 feet that way. You're pulling them out of the area. That's right. But there are logistics here. And, and one of the things that's really driven me crazy, and I don't have to be pro or anti Rachel Notley. I don't have to be pro or anti Justin Trudeau. But the implication that some people are making, the assertions, uh, the statements that people are making that our elected officials at uh, municipal, provincial, or federal levels somehow don't care about Fort McMurray, don't care about Alberta's forests, well, it, know, it, it, it is maddening. Exactly. And I'll take that a step further. The implication that our leaders wouldn't check with those actually fighting the fire with the experience of wildfire fighting to ask what they need. So you think for political reasons, and I don't know who you is, but you think for political reasons that Rachel Notley doesn't want to do a business with BC or with this particular company, or you think that Trudeau doesn't want to start any kind of trade uh, with Russia those Russian bombers are very similar in nature to the Mars bomber. Big aircraft that take a long time to maneuver, fill, 
They're not effective in a fire like Now this. throw in a language barrier and also exactly. throw in the implication of the political uh, ramifications of accepting help from Russia in, in a circumstance like this. Think of the message it sends to Canadians. Think of the message it sends to uh, other G8 sure. nations. Think of the message it sends to the United States. Uh, you don't just go ahead and accept an offer from Vladimir Putin uh, without considering well, of course. some of the many ramifications yep. of that. And, and people are so quickly, and I understand that this is an emotional time in Alberta, and I understand it's it's an emotional story. You say one wrong thing about it, and you're bound to offend people without even intending to. But people need to take a moment and consider the source of their information. Or at they, least research. This, this is why I, I want to defend all the yous that we're pointing okay. out right now. It is an emotional time. People are frustrated. People have lost homes, families. Of theirs. Of course. They, it seems like people aren't doing their job when you hear that a wildfire has doubled in size. Sure, 200, but you missing 000. a step, though. No, I know, but I'm just saying... Emotion, when emotions yes. run high, when you get in a fight with your wife and you're frustrated about one little thing, suddenly you don't even remember what you're fighting about. Yeah. Like you're just, and then you sit down and like, okay, you know what? This wasn't worth it. Now I've got to buy flowers and make it all better. I, and yeah. that's what's happening here. People want to be mad at the Red Cross yeah. because you're hearing about people who don't have money in their pockets. It's easy to say, why don't, why aren't they throwing cash out to all of these people? There's reasons. There's processes. There's a reason. You hear about this Martian Mars bomber. It can solve the world's problems. Like this is what you're hearing. Why the heck wouldn't we use it? Mm -hmm. I get how you get wrapped up in it. And yeah, it's easy to bypass the facts because those aren't in front of you. Your emotions are, sure. are at the forefront. If there was somebody who was evacuated from Fort McMurray that were to come up to me after a show anytime in the next hundred years and say, hey, why didn't we use the Mars bomber? I would be happy to sit, buy a beer and explain what I know about the bomber. I guess my problem is those individuals sitting on their deck in you know, sundry who think, yeah, I think I'll send this meme out. That's a fairly funny wow, meme. Wow, just you know? calling out Sunday. Well, I just I had to pick some town, right? <laughs> yeah. and you, you mentioned the Red Cross, and we could spend the whole show on the Red Cross as well. The Red Cross is, a, is disaster emergency relief. They have to move fast. They have to have boots on the ground anywhere in the world anytime disaster hits. So what you can't fundraise on day one. You can't say that there's a massive fire in Fort McMurray. Let's have a fundraiser. You have to have money that's always coming into the Red Cross. So if all this money raised um, for Fort McMurray does not get used in Fort McMurray, and the condition to that would be that everything's restored the way it needs to be and all money that was requested or required is used, I have no problem with the Red Cross banking money for the next disaster. The, the fact that they were able to move so quickly on this disaster is because they had those reserves. That's the nature of the business. But people were not donating to the reserves. They, the messaging was when they said, you know, text this number, go to, call this phone number, or go to this website and donate. It made it, the, it, in people's minds, it sounded like if I donate $5, that's going into the wallet of somebody who needs to buy a toothbrush because theirs got burned in a fire. And I think what people need to have is confidence in the institutions that they're supporting. And there is absolutely nothing wrong. And, and I might suggest that I think we're far enough removed from the fire coming up on two weeks now that we can start to ask these questions directly to sure. the CEO of the Red Cross sure. and other relief agencies. What I think really matters most is that people that wanted to take the $5 or the $5,000 donation and put it directly into the hands of evacuees have done that as well. And there yeah. have been incredible stories that we've seen across the province. I know we could talk about this at length and, and we will continue to cover this story and do it justice in, in days and weeks to come. Uh, here on 630 Ched. I think we've accomplished our purpose here, which was just to share how we're feeling, yep. a little peek behind the curtain, and provide some clarity to uh, the extensiveness of our coverage, and give you an opportunity to chime in from home. You can send us an email anytime via 630Ched.com. Thank you for tuning into this week's edition of The Announcers.